Hi, I'm Miles Mandrell, and I'm a freelance director and musician in New York City. And this is my couch. Hello! And, uh, now I'll start again. Wait, hold on. Do I look like I'm slouching? I'm, like, very self-conscious about like it. Self no. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, like, super self-conscious about it. <laughs> I can't understand. We're gonna count that as the beginning. So, uh, hello. Welcome to, um, yet another episode of Other People's Couches. Uh, is this episode... You don't know. Ray, is this episode four or five? Five, right? Episode five. I like oh. to keep track. Um, and I'm here with the wonderful Miles Manduel. Um, I'm saying that correct. Yes, you are. Yeah. You are. I wasn't sure if it'd be like a Manduel-y. I get Mandueli. that every once in a while because you can't really tell what ethnicity the last name is. That's true. What is the ethnicity for that What one? do you think it is? Oh, what a terrible question. Uh, German. That's that's a noble guess. Um, okay. It's actually made up from Ellis Island. My understanding is that when my oh. ancestors came over from what was then Prussia and what is now Latvia, it was something more robust like Mondvel, but it was too cumbersome for them to say at Ellis Island, so they wrote down whatever the hell they felt like writing. I think Ellis Island was like made America that much less interesting. Probably. For That's everyone. why we have a lot of Smiths and Greys who are fascinating people with dull last names. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, you get the whole, you know, the whole John Smith and... I wonder, actually, was Smith an actual last name before you came over, before, like, uh, Ellis Island happened? Uh, I mean, blacksmiths. Oh, true. You okay. know. Shoe smiths. Smiths, people who made things. Smiths. Mm -hmm. Camera Smiths. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like and uh, Miles, as he uh, said, is a director, freelance director. Now, how mm -hmm. does that? How does a freelance director work? Do you just kind of throw yourself into a production, answer Craigslist ads? Uh, yeah. Actually, very few things that I do come off of Craigslist. Um, basically, it's all about who you know. And finding assistant directing gigs in New York is like finding a needle on a haystack. A lot of it has to do with writing directors, especially those whose work you admire, which is something that I'm about to like really sit down and focus on shortly. Mm -hmm. um, most of the gigs that I've had this year and been fortunate enough to have worked on came out of pre-existing relationships. Um, I am the social media coordinator for the movement the the social media coordinator for the movement theater studio. I can speak English, but I stumble over my words sometimes. Ellis Island kind of, you know, got You know, you know. <laughs> um, but movement theater studio has been really great. I do social media for them, and one of the co-directors is Adrian Capstein, who is a movement theater, er, one of the co-directors is Adrian Capstein, who was a... Uh, one of the assistant movement coordinators on War Horse. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yes. She's like the real deal. So I got in touch with her and I said, hey, do you guys have anyone who uses this work that we do at the studio um, who uses it in terms of directing? And she said, you know what? Actually, I would be happy to have you. So I got to assist her. That's wonderful. Yeah. So we did a show called Light, a Dark Comedy, which went up at the New Victory Theater as part of their lab work series. And it starred Tammy Stronach from The NeverEnding Story. Oh, I have no idea who that is. She was the childlike uh, princess. The childlike queen? Childlike empress. The childlike empress. From the first one? Yeah, from the first one. I, you know, I haven't seen those movies. All I just remember is that, like, being unnecessarily upset when something bad happened in that film. Did Artak die someone? I don't remember. I haven't seen it since they used to do reruns of it on the Disney Channel. That's the only time I ever actually saw it. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Hmm. Okay. Well, but that's wonderful. And then, mm -hmm. um, what else, like, have you gotten anything else from that? Or mm, well, the next, the thing that I'm working on right now is I'm working on a new, another new play called Flamingo, uh, by Alex Trow, which is going up at the Sanguine Theater Company. Mm -hmm. And I got hooked up with that because my roommate Alec did a show with them in the fall called Exit Twenty Seven. It was another new play. And we got friendly with the artistic director, and I sent her an email when I found out they were doing this play, because I'd heard, actually heard a reading of it, and mm -hmm. I really liked it. So I said, hey, um, I'm interested in this. If you would like me, I would be happy to lend my services. And so we've been working on that. So now how is it that you uh, are able to send these like nice emails and get something out of it, while somebody like uh, myself or other people I know who are like, hey, I like what you do also... Can I help and never get a response? Is there a trick to it? Do you throw in like some no, jokes? No, I think it's statistics and it's also who you know because I have just as many unreturned emails that That's I stew true. over every and you once don't wanna, in a while. you don't want to bring those up. That's right. totally fair. You yeah. know, and I think it's a rite of passage. You know, um, they say that the brick walls kind of exist to see how badly you want things. So if you really want something, you know, you'll email more than once. And yeah, I, I have fair. infinitely more unreturned emails than I do returned emails. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I'm still pretty busy. Well, I just inter uh, sent Michael Sarah an email um, asking, because he just uh, released an album that was actually pretty good. I liked it. And um, it's like, contact Michael Sarah on his Bandcamp page. Mm -hmm. I was like, 
obviously I'm going to contact Michael Sayer, and he hasn't returned my email yet, so... Well, he's an international celebrity. That would yeah, be like asking like, Kate Blanchett if you could take her out for gelato. There is absolutely <laughs> no way that Kate Blanchett and Michael Sarah are on the same level. No offense to either of them. They're both international celebrities. Terrible. But, like, it's Michael Sarah. Right, right. You know, he's, like, weird. I thought maybe, you know... He might run into him at a bar or something. He's doing a show yeah. on Broadway in the fall. Oh, I think I just... Uh, it's in previews now, right? You know, it's a I, three person. Uh, yes, it's this is our youth, which is a great play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, apparently, the reviews were great. I don't know where I saw the. Oh, we went to go see Frank the other yesterday. Frank? Yeah, the uh, Michael Fassbender film. It's about the guy with the the comedian. Oh, the I thought comedian. you meant an actual person named Frank. Oh no, no, we went. To, do, don't you know Frank? The Frank? Oh my God, Frank! Uh, have you not heard? But um, yeah, they, it was. They had a preview. That's I've never seen a stage play with like actual previews in a movie theater. I don't know. Was, oh, yeah. Unless yeah. it's like a musical, like a Sondheim or a, Sometimes they do that, depending on how it's being done and also right. who's in it. And like sometimes they'll do um, broadcast at National Theater. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, going on of uh, the emails and stuff. So you are... Now, you said you did The Ugly One, which I looked up um, and saw oh, that it's a, a yes. German play. Yes. And um, the New York Times had a great review of it. And then you did a revival a year later? See, the thing is that, is that, that revival? I... Revival? Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that the play had premiered in New York as recently as it had, because, <laughs> because I wasn't in New York when the play premiered. Oh, yeah, fair, fair. And I read it, and I really wanted to do it as a directing project, and it just never transpired, mm. but I still really wanted to do it. So I actually wrote to McKenna um, Productions. Oh, right, because I saw the right, involved. Right, mm-hmm. right, and they gave me $2,000 to do it. Oh, wonderful. And the deal was with the rights company that I could produce the play and get the rights to it, I just couldn't have reviews because it would compare it to the Soho production. Ah, that's why. Because I was trying to find yeah. reviews. It's like, ugly one, Miles Manuel, no, reviews. And it's such a shame because everyone on it just had such a good time. I, it was the best thing that I directed and I had like the time of my life directing it. And it just, time-wise, didn't work out in a way that I could have it reviewed. Right. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. But you enjoyed it. So much so that actually great. you wouldn't even let me see like a bootleg copy because you, you don't well, want that to da- taunt the experience. So. Honestly, like we worked really hard to create uh, a the- uh, an experience that was uniquely theatrical using a mm-hmm. lot of movement. Mm-hmm. And the theater itself was probably not much bigger than this room. Um, it was a 30-seater. And if you, when I watched the video, I just thought to myself, oh my God, this does not in any way represent what happened in the audience that night because, um, you know... There were certain characters that, like, the audience just, like, ate right up. Mm-hmm. And you might be a little perplexed why the audience starts applauding in the middle of the show because you can't see the oh, way an actor right. exited particularly. Okay. Um, but if you listen to it, you get the gist of what's going on. Yeah. And, you know, it was the first time I could ever, like, look back at my work and, like, watch it and think objectively, oh, okay, this, this, and this, and not just beat myself up and go, oh, you should have been this and you should have been that, and, you know. Well, I think if anybody within a creative light though like there's a certain sense of maturity too where you're not so devastated every time one thing goes wrong yeah no a lot of things went really well on that oh I I thought you said really wrong no no, come on we just talked about this no 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 no. see I have this problem where I don't give myself enough credit most Uh, of the time okay so um being able to watch it you know I sat back there like behind one of my really good friends who's an amazing director and I was just like like kind of pooping myself the entire time. <laughs> I was like, "Oh no, he's gonna hate it!" Like, and projecting my insecurity onto him. And then the minute the audience like showed that they really enjoyed the show, I just went <sighs> and just let it all out. It yeah, cool. and I could sit back and I could go, "Okay, if I were to do this again, I would clean this up, clean this up. Okay, this transition, and then like you know, just watch it with more respect towards my work and not judge it as much." You had mentioned that you have a Kickstarter video coming out? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we're producing Giancarlo Minotti's The Medium mm-hmm. in October, and I'm really excited about it. I can't tell you too much about casting yet, because it's not finalized, That's but fine. That's fine. it's going to be a really good group of people. The team that we have assembled so far is like... So tell me a little bit like about the uh, project and just like, um, I don't know, what drew you to it and about it and everything. Well, what really interests me most about the theater is... is where everything kind of comes together. Mm -hmm. And Minotti is a very uh, underrepresented writer, I think, because essentially he's writing an opera, but he also writes operas that appeal to people who would go see a play. 
Oh. So he bridges the world between opera and drama in a very interesting way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he wrote not only the music, but he also wrote the libretto. And so it's just really tangible acting material. And it's about this woman who's a phony psychic n- named Baba. But her psychic name is Madame Flora. And she preys on people who are grieving. Okay, yeah. You know, yeah. most of the people who come to her have lost children or something very terrible. And um, she, she employs her daughter Monica and then this mute boy named Toby to really um, play up the theatrics of what goes on in a seance. Like, Monica yeah. will provide the voice of, like, uh, a deceased baby boy who drowned or the daughter of this woman. And they really prey on these people so that they keep coming back. Ah. And what makes the event of the play interesting is that it's the day that um, Baba taps into something that is higher than herself. And while she's in the middle of one of her seances, something touches her on the neck, and she bugs out. And that's the, I mean, that's like the crux of the whole... Yeah, I can't say too much without getting, giving it away, even though right, it's a totally. famous piece, but I don't want anyone to come in knowing what's going to happen. So, <laughs> so don't Wikipedia it? Is that the deal? Like, you get the synopsis? You but, could. You right, could. I won't, I won't. But, um, yeah, no, it's a really interesting piece for, for actors who sing. It sounds like, I mean, it also sounds like it's got all the elements for perfect opera material. It's yeah, like, you know, you have yeah. To, and it's kind of Breaking Bad-esque where you have, like, the, the protagonist is also, like, the antagonist. And mm-hmm. Kind of, yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. It's super interesting, and the music is very haunting. It sounds very much like, um, like... Not necessarily Bernard Herrmann, who wrote a lot of the music to Alfred Hitchcock movies, okay. but it's definitely in that vein. So just like a little little airy, a little ethereal kind of like... I like to t- think of it like Sweeney Todd in a psychic parlor. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. good, okay, okay. Yeah, it's really interesting, and this writer just sort of gets me very excited, mm-hmm. you know, because you can't, you can't phone it in. So um, tell me exactly like what you are raising the money for on Kickstarter, and what are your prizes going to be? <laughs> <laughs> we're actually talking about the prizes now, because in this space, there is uh, a table that we're planning on using for the table for the seance. Mm-hmm. So we're thinking that if you donate X amount, you get to sit at the table. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, because we want to make it very immersive, so when you come into this space, um, it's like, oh, are you here for the seance? Ah, I like that. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Yeah, we want to make it as interactive as possible mm. because we live in an age of both uh, a very dire need for stimulation because we're always on our phones. Right. And then also we need um, theater that's as stimulating as technology. And people like to be uh, invited in, I think, a little bit more than I, t- I we mean, typically I have a rule where if I'm going to go to any live performance, I have to be in the front row. Well, there is no front row here. Oh, is it just yeah. standing room? Well, it's thing, a big or? room. I mean, you, we're rearranging it, and it's mm-hmm. going to have 50 seats, and we're just kind of messing with the playing space. And I think this is actually the first time the West End has done something like this. So it's this. just going to be like one row. Yeah, one ah. big room, and then you know everybody's going to be sitting around it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really excited because I believe that like if you read a play and you like it and you see exactly how you should do it, then you shouldn't do it. Because if you're not going to explore and figure out how it works, then it's not... It's not worth it if you know what you're going to do already. Oh, okay. You know, some people have shows down to a science, and that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. But for me, I like to be able to um, solve, problem solve yeah. and figure out very quickly what needs to happen. So and you like to make things complicated yeah. for yourself. No, not necessarily. <laughs> but, like, I think really well on my feet, mm-hmm. and I don't like to... I find that if you make uh, a judgment, whether it's good or bad, you shoot yourself in the foot because right. it, shoot, it closes you off to any other possibilities. Mm-hmm. Um... So, sorry, my mind blank. For Raising money. Raising money. Right. So, yes. so what exactly? So like? we, may have, um, we may have seats that uh, you can sit in uh, that are an active part of the performance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we may have, you know, some little prizes from small business owners that we're friendly with that we may give away as part of uh, either the Kickstarter campaign or a silent auction at the Cabaret on September 20th. Oh, fantastic. Um you know, and we're raising money not just for this production, but also for a possible production in the spring. Now, is this on behalf of your uh, the theater you just started? Like yeah, the theater yeah. company? Okay, so it's not just for the production so much as it is just like... To keep things going. Right, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. I want this theater company to be as much of an artistic home for me as it is for people whose work I admire. And what's the, the company called? We're calling it Taksu Theater Company. Taksu, now why Taksu? Taksu is a word that I appropriated from Balinese dance, which is totally geeky of me. <laughs> but I studied mask with this guy named Per Brahe, and he always talks about the Taksu. And it's a fancy way of saying that someone has it, 
But in Balinese dance, it means that someone is no longer dancing with just themselves, but that something otherworldly has happened with them, and that they are now dancing with the gods. Oh, that's quite fantastic. So there are different uh, levels of what we talk about, like divine light, that mm-hmm. appear through my work, and so I just think it kind of all goes together. That's beautiful. That's great. Very well done. Well, I mean, Baba, who's in the medium, gets what's coming to her, and at right. the end, she she hasn't figured out the answer to her question, and she thinks that, you know, she actually prays at one point, and she's an atheist at the beginning of the show. Oh. So, uh, you know, I don't consciously choose shows. Like, my gut instinct said, maybe you should do the medium, and sometimes I stumble across why I'm doing it right, along the you way. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't sure why I was doing the ugly one, other than the gut response I had, and then across the period of rehearsing it, I was like, oh, this is why. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't always make decisions why before I do things. But, you know, um, it's important to be able to keep going with things. Right. Because I have at this point amassed an army of, like, super talented people. Uh, and people have come up to me. They're like, what are you doing next? I want in on this. And, you know, uh, I try to make it as little about me as possible. So I just want to make sure that, you know, I pick a play that I'm really interested in. And I can keep doing it without running into financial issues, you know? So that's the thing. You know, you can have all the people in the world that are willing to work for you, which I'm so grateful for. But at the same time, at the end of the day, I think people should be paid for their work. That's great. I think there's a lot of people out there who would really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. People need to eat. Artists need to eat. (laughs) (laughs) Right? We don't get those. We don't get these awesome bodies for nothing. Well, by eating nothing, actually. Yeah. We do. But, um, so bringing it around to the final question, which is always one of my favorite questions, but, uh, tell me the story behind your couch. And now, is this an Ikea couch? It is an Ikea couch. Because the last, uh, interview I did, um, a girl had a couch very similar, it was L-shape and everything, but it was not Ikea. She said, I think it was like Target or something. Okay. And I was like, mm. Um. <laughs> nope. But, anyway. Well, okay, so we moved into this apartment at the beginning of July, and, um, at our last place, we didn't have a living room. We lived on the Upper East Side. We had no living room, and the kitchen just sort of immediately went into the bathroom. Excuse me. And, uh, you know, it, we're lucky that we all get along so well that we didn't get into many... Is it the same roommates? Yeah, the yeah. Oh, more or less a couple of people. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, we, we only ran into issues when it uh, came to... No, wait. What do I want to say? Edit, edit, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, what, we didn't have many issues concerning the space itself because mm-hmm. we didn't have a living room, so we didn't fuss over, um, uh, you know, chairs or couches because we just didn't have them. Right. So when we moved here, we wanted to make sure that, like, it was exactly what we wanted. And we went through, like, tons of different ideas for couches and dishes and blah, 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 anything you can imagine. And then, finally, uh, Alejandro's mom was really generous, and she ca- she took Alejandro to Ikea, bought him this couch, and we all just... I just... That's fine, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> all right. Alejandro's mom bought us this couch, and it also folds out into a futon, because we have a lot of people coming in and out. Like, some of our friends might be coming in from uh, a gig that they had, so, like, they might be looking for a sublet. Mm-hmm. So while they're doing that, we have this bed that we can offer them for the night. Actually, that was, like, when... Um... Ray and I were looking for a couch. That was, like, my thing. I was like, I have family, I have friends, I need them to stay on, my, like, a couch. It needs yeah. to pull out. It needs to pull out. I think it's, like, not having a couch that can can do that, like, mm-hmm. kinda, it kind of sucks, you know? Like, you want to be able to offer someone something nice to sleep in and, like, yeah. you know. Well, before we had an air mattress that we would put, like, either next to one of our beds or in the kitchen, but then, like, the door would open in the middle of the night because someone was working late and they would wake up the person that was sleeping in the kitchen and it was all kinds of, like... We're lucky that we all like each other a well, lot. This is also a beautiful space. It's and an amazing I, The dishes look great. They match the couch very well. Yeah. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, well but um, that being said, uh, Miles, thank you so much. No problem, um, it's man. It's been a pleasure having you here. And uh, this is Other People's Couches. Mm-hmm.